Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud seminar. Today, we have the pleasure of having Jonathan Rolader, who will speak about inequalities between Neumann and Dirichlet Laplacian eigenvalues on planar domains. Jonathan, the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, very grateful for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Uh, actually, for the for the second time. So two years ago, I gave a talk here uh, on a different topic, namely on uh, the hotspots conjecture. And um, somehow, if anybody remembers anything from my talk two years ago, which I'm not expecting, then you might recognize some methods that are used here. And although this is a seemingly different problem, but still can be in common. So um, here is the plan of my talk. So uh, first I want to introduce you to the kind of eigenvalue inequalities I'm going to speak about uh, and show you some previous results. And um, then in order to contribute something to the topic, I will first introduce you to a, say, non-standard variation, the principle for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Then I will apply this uh, in order to achieve something new about directly normal eigenvalue inequalities. That's the plan. Uh, so let us start with introducing the inequalities that I'm interested in. So this is the general setting. So everything is like what you are used to. So we've got a bounded connected domain with some minimal regularity, say it's a Lipschitz domain in RD. I consider the Laplacian eigenvalue problem minus Laplacian phi is equal to lambda phi plus some boundary condition. And uh, the boundary condition in this talk will either be Neumann or Dirichlet, meaning the derivative with respect to the outer unit normal vector on the boundary is zero almost everywhere. And, uh, or for the directly case, the function itself, the trace of the function is vanishing on the boundary. And then as you all know, uh, for the Neumann problem, uh, so I, I will try to be consistent in my talk about this color coding about the Neumann, everything that is Neumann is orange and everything that's directly is, is blue. So for the Neumann problem, uh, we've got one zero eigenvalue corresponding to the constant eigenfunction, and then a sequence of positive eigenvalues possibly repeating each other in the case of higher multiplicities accumulating to plus infinity. And for the Dirichlet case, we have the same kind of behavior except for that the first eigenvalue is already positive and has a non-trivial or non-constant eigenfunction, um, but still has multiplicity one. Um, as you all know, in most cases and for most geometries, we cannot compute these eigenvalues explicitly, but uh, for some cases we can. And as a little illustration of the questions I'm interested in here, I would like to show you just a representation of the Dirichlet and Neumann eigenvalues for some simple domains for which you can compute. So the most simple one is certainly an interval in the real line. And then the eigenvalues have a special feature that the Dirichlet and Neumann eigenvalues just coincide. So again, blue is Dirichlet, orange is Neumann. Uh, and in one, the only difference is that there's the extra eigenvalue zero for, for Neumann. If you instead look at two-dimensional domains, then, then you actually see a bit, and a bit more interesting behavior somehow. So if you take, for instance, a square zero pi times zero pi in the plane, uh, you somehow find that the eigenvalues are sums of squares of integers. And um, yeah, I mean, every Dirichlet eigenvalue is also a Neumann eigenvalue, but you have, in a sense, considerably more Neumann eigenvalues than Dirichlet eigenvalues. And here we already come a little bit to what I will be interested in, namely, given a Dirichlet eigenvalue, for instance, the first one, how many Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues do I find up to this point? So here, for instance, 
For the first Dirichlet eigenvalue in this example, I find three Neumann eigenvalues counting multiplicities strictly below this, or four Neumann eigenvalues, including this point. And you can count for the second and third one, and so on. And you see somehow, um, to some extent, there are more Neumann eigenvalues than Dirichlet eigenvalues in any in any interval. And that is what we can try to, to quantify somehow. And if you look at the third example, which is the, the unit disk in the plane, you get a similar picture. Um, so for instance, below the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, there are three uh, Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues, uh, somehow showing that, um, well, at least in two dimensions, somehow this seems to be the maximal, I mean, just from these few examples, that seems to be the maximum that you can get. So we can somehow at the maximum get three Neumann eigenvalues below the first Dirichlet eigenvalue. Um, this is not a really a new topic. Um, there are quite a few results uh, dating back at least to the 1950s. I will show you two of them. Um, the first one is the most general thing about this uh, counting Neumann eigenvalues below a given directly eigenvalue that you can say about any bounded Lipschitz domain. While the se second one is, is a, an improved result that you get when you as assume convex uh, convexity of the domain. So what's the first result? On, on a bounded Lipschitz domain in any space dimension D, here actually D has to be lar strictly larger than one, um, mu k plus one, so the k plus first Neumann Laplacian eigenvalue is strictly below the k directly Laplacian eigenvalue. Um, this has been shown, I think, for the first, so for k equal to one, this is already due to Polia. And then there were several improvements during during the years, and the, the very final result with the strict inequality and no further regularity assumptions on the boundary is due to Filonov. Um, so for instance, that means like if I have any bounded domain with Lipschitz boundary condition, or even a bit, actually even a bit weaker, um, then you, for instance, find at least two Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues below the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, or you find five, at least five below the uh, below the fourth Dirichlet eigenvalue, and so on. Um, and that is the best result that we by now can show for all or that we have for all bounded Lipschitz domains. Um, there are better results, as I said, for convex domains, and this also dates back already to the 50s and got improved and generalized later on uh, by Levine and Weinberger uh, in the 80s. So on omega being a bounded convex domain in space dimension D, actually always the Neumann eigenvalue with index k plus D is below or equal the kth directly eigenvalue. So what you see here is an index shift uh, that is equal to the dimension of the space. And that is true for all, for all eigenvalues. Uh, and I will show you the proof uh, of that, or uh, like the main idea of the proof of that in a second. Um, let me just add this little addition that the inequality is strict if the domain is sufficiently smooth. And um, I want to show you the proof for some simple situation um, in order to show you where convexity enters the proof and why this specific proof somehow seems to only work under the convexity assumption. Before I do that, here's a little interlude. Uh, I would just, just like to mention that this kind of problems, these kind of inequalities um, have attracted a lot of interest in recent years uh, in all kinds of situations. I mean, except for comparing Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues 
Uh, there are some results for other boundary conditions like Robin or uh, mixed Dirich Neumann and so on. And there are certain results on manifolds. Um, there are results for magnetic Schrodinger operators uh, following from some considerations on the Laplace and on the Heisenberg group. Uh, there's something for Schrodinger operators with electric potentials, uh, Stokes operators, biharmonic operators, and so on. So there has been a lot of interest in comparing the eigenvalues of two incarnations of some Laplacian or some, some elliptic operator. Um, that is due to that these eigenvalue inequalities are useful at many different places. For instance, uh, when you study nodal domains, and I will get back to that a, a tiny little bit in the end of my talk. Um, but now, as I told you, I would like to show you the idea of basically the proof by Payne and Levin Weinberger, uh, how to show that, for instance, the third Neumann Laplacian eigenvalue is always strictly below the first Dirac eigenvalue on a convex smooth domain, say for simplicity in R2. Um, how do I do that? Of course, that is a variational proof. Um, so one has to construct suitable test functions. So what do I do? I start with an eigenfunction corresponding to the first eigenvalue of the Dirac Laplacian. Except for this eigenfunction, I also take the partial derivatives of this eigenfunction with respect to both space variables. And then I take any linear combination of the eigenfunction itself the, and the two partial derivatives. Um, these are all, of course, suitable test functions for the standard variational principle for the Neumann Laplacian because the test space there is just H1, no boundary conditions required. And all these functions, phi, d1, phi, and d2, phi, satisfy the same boundary condition, namely minus Laplacian applied to the function is equal to lambda 1, applied to the function, just that the partial derivatives do not satisfy the directly boundary conditions or any other like simple boundary condition. So it's not very easy to specify or to find out which boundary conditions they actually would satisfy. Uh, but we don't care for the moment. And uh, we just plug this in into the standard quadratic form for the integral of the squared gradient. And what do we get? So let me summarize the part that contains the partial derivatives just into one function xi. Um, so I have basically alpha times phi plus xi, and I can decompose that into the part that belongs to phi, the part that... Am I the only one who lost sound? Yeah, no, I just lost sound as well. Jonathan, we don't hear you anymore. He doesn't seem to hear us either. Uh, Jean, perhaps you can put the recording on, on pause. Yeah. I explain you this. Thanks. I was just going to explain you this a little proof and how convexity enters. So basically, you split into the part consisting of the eigenfunction itself and the part containing partial derivatives. And you uh, get then just this standard thing. And for the first part, you know it's an eigenfunction, so this is equal to lambda 1 times the integral of phi squared, basically. Um, for, the, uh, for the middle part, you just integrate by parts. Phi satisfies the Dirac boundary condition, so you don't get any boundary terms. And you, um, get, you get the Laplacian of Xi, and since Xi satisfies the same differential equation, you get the lambda one in front. And for the last one, um, you have to do some computation because this is now the gradient of Xi. So this is a term consisting or containing second derivatives of Phi. So here you have to do something. And I mean, it's kind of a standard computation that you can do. Uh, and what happens is the boundary terms do not disappear completely. So you get lambda 1 times xi squared, but then you get a term containing the curvature of the boundary. Uh, and here you want to estimate this whole thing, this negative term by uh, 
by zero from above. So here you want or you need some sign condition on the curvature. And here's exactly where convexity enters. You want the curvature to be non-negative everywhere in order to estimate this term. And if the curvature, so on a, on a smooth domain, actually the curvature is positive at least on some part of the boundary. And then you see that you get a strict inequality because um, you can employ some unique continuation argument in order to show that the gradient uh, of phi cannot vanish on like some open non-empty subset of the boundary. So here you get a strict inequality, but you really need that. Apparently, you really really need that the 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 curvature is is non-negative. So, so convexity enters. And what have you shown now? Well, you have shown that the Rayleigh quotient of psi is below lambda one, and that is for psi uh, that is any linear combination of phi or its two partial derivatives. And it's not very difficult to show that these three functions are linearly independent. Uh, therefore, you get a three-dimensional test space on which the Rayleigh quotient is below lambda one. Um, so this is, has been well known for, for many years. Um, but despite uh, this argument requiring convexity, there has been somehow at least numerical evidence that this property that of this index shift given by the space dimension, so mu k plus d is strictly below lambda k, um, could be more something more general, not restricted to convex domains. And there is uh, there is, for instance, a JFA paper by Ben Gurria, Levitin, and Panofsky, where they are somehow trying to extend actually another proof, the one by Filonov for the shift plus one, to um, to to more general uh, to the more general situation to get a plus d here, um, and that leads to very interesting uh, very interesting considerations, um, but. So far, unfortunately, not to a, to a proof of this inequality for general domains. And there's also some rather recent numerical observation by, by Graham Cox and his co-authors, um, somehow showing that actually, although it is apparently more difficult to prove such an inequality for non-convex domains, um, the inequality seems to be even more valid if the domains are non-convex in the sense that you potentially get even more Neumann eigenvalues below the k theoretically eigenvalue. In, in, I mean, in many, in many cases that you can somehow compute numerically. Um, so what can I do in the non-convex case? That is somehow the, the question. Um, and I want to show you, before I get to the non-convex case, I want to show you um, a variational principle for the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacian, which is not the usual one, uh, but slightly differently. And that is what you might have, in theory, have seen two years ago in my talk on the on the hotspots conjecture, in a, in a different form, though. Um, here is something uh, that you probably need a second to, to digest. And what is that? Uh, I'll read it out and explain it. So on now everything is two-dimensional. So I have a bound Lipschitz domain omega in R2. And on that bounded Lipschitz domain, I consider this bilinear form. Since I'm working with the Laplacian, I just uh, decided to do everything real valued, not complex. So there is a certain quadratic form um, or a certain bilinear form defined on vector fields. This is no longer on scalar functions, but it is on vector fields. Um, and you take a vector field U and a vector field V with sufficient regularity, I come to that. And then you take divergence U times divergence V plus omega of u times omega of v. And what is omega? Omega is actually 
uh, say the the vorticity of you or um, some kind of two dimensional version of of the curl of you. So, um, what am I doing here? So basically, if I integrate by parts. I'm not yet talking about boundary conditions, but if I integrate by parts formally and I put the divergent to the other side, I get gradient times divergence. And if I integrate by parts here, there's something similar. There's not exactly the gradient, but something that's orthogonal to the gradient point-wise. And then I get actually a formula for the uh, for the Laplacian in on, on two component vector fields. So somehow this is related to the Laplacian um, on vector fields. And what, I, what do I take as a domain of this bilinear form, except for the necessary re regularity requirements in order to write this down, I require that these vector fields are tangential on the boundary. So they are orthogonal to the normal vector on the boundary. And what I'm, am I doing here, basically I'm, what I want to make sure here is that if I take, for instance, gradients of Neumann Laplacian eigenfunctions or functions in the domain of the Neumann Laplacian, then they would satisfy this condition. So if U is gradient psi for some psi that satisfies the Neumann boundary condition, then obviously um, this vector field would be in the domain of this quadratic form. So this bilinear form is obviously symmetric, it is non-negative, obviously, uh, and you can easily show that it is, uh, well, closed in the terminology of Cato, or it defines a, um, it defines a Hilbert space. Um, so it actually defines a self-adjoint non-negative operator in the two-component L2 space. And the somehow interesting or miraculous thing about this corresponding operator is um, basically its spectrum coincides with the union of the spectra of the Neumann Laplacian and the Dirichlet Laplacian, except for the eigenvalue zero. So that's somehow the claim, the main claim here. So if omega is simply connected, then the spectrum of A consists pre precisely of the positive eigenvalues of the Neumann Laplacian together with the positive eigenvalues, so all eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Laplacian, including multiplicities. Okay, so yeah, try to, I will show you how this connection comes, comes up. So try to just keep in mind what the bilinear form actually looks like. And I will show you the connection to the Neumann and Dirichlet spectra. Right, um, so, First of all, if I take a, an eigenfunction of the Neumann Laplacian corresponding to any positive eigenvalue, and I take the gradient of it, and as I explained to you, this gradient is in the domain of the bilinear form. And if I test this vector field in the bilinear form against anything that's in the domain of the form, then the first thing, so I have a divergence part and I have a vorticity or curl part, the curl part immediately disappears because this is a gradient. So we are only left with the divergence part. And for the divergence part, you just get divergence of some gradient, which is the Laplacian. Then you employ, employ the boundary, if, sorry, the, the eigenvalue equation. And you can integrate by parts to get the divergence into a gradient on the other side. So what you get is mu times the integral of gradient psi times v. So the form applied to gradient psi against an arbitrary element in the form domain is equal to mu times the L2 scalar product of gradient psi with, with V. And that implies gradient psi is actually in the kernel of A minus mu. So there is obviously a connection between Neumann Laplacian eigenfunctions and, and eigenvalues and this new operator acting on vector fields. And I can actually do the same for directly Laplacian eigenfunctions, though if I would just take the gradient, of course I would not 
end up in the domain of the of the of the, of the uh, bilinear form because I wouldn't necessarily satisfy the boundary condition. But if I take this perpendicular gradient of the Dirichlet Laplacian eigenfunction, which is just the gradient rotated by 90 degrees in the plane, so minus d2 phi d1 phi, then this is actually orthogonal to the normal vector because the scalar product of this with the normal vector on the boundary is basically the tangential derivative of phi along the boundary and phi is constant, actually zero on the boundary. So that works well. And if I just plug it in, then, well, this is a divergence-free vector field. So I only have this vorticity part left. And for this vorticity part, this is actually, again, the Laplacian. And bringing, integrating by parts, the, the vorticity to the other side gives me this perpendicular gradient again. Um, so from the eigenvalue inequality, I just get, again, such an such an equality showing us that the orthogonal or the perpendicular gradient of phi is actually an eigenfunction or an eigenfield of the operator A. So, and now, so far we haven't really used that the domain is simply connected and really we don't need it so far. But if the domain is simply connected, then there is a particularly simple form of the so-called Helmholtz decomposition Namely, um, the L2 space, well, the Helmholtz decomposition is basically the decomposition of the L2, the vector valued L2 into a gradient space and some divergence free space. And on a simply connected domain where uh, all uh, curl free vector fields or vorticity free vector fields have a potential, the decomposition is particularly simple and gives the gradient of so L2 vector valued is just the gradient of H1 plus uh, the perpendicular gradients of H10 functions. And it is not difficult to show that actually the gradients of Neumann Laplacian eigenfunctions span this whole space, this whole subspace gradient H1, and the perpendicular gradients of Dirichlet Laplacian eigenfunctions span this whole subspace. So the perpendicular gradients of H10. So in the simply connected part, uh, case, we have actually found that the operator, this new operator A decomposes according to this, so diagonally according to this decomposition. And we have computed the spectrum of the first part, which is exactly the positive spectrum of the Neumann Laplacian, as well as the spectrum of the second part, which is exactly the spectrum of the Dirichlet Laplacian, including multiplicities. So um, what does this tell us? Well, one way of looking at it is um, in terms of in terms of a min-max principle. So namely if omega is a bounded simply connected Lipschitz domain in the plane, and now I take a sequence, the sequence of eigenvalues of this operator A, then this sequence contains all Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues except zero and all Dirichlet Laplacian eigenvalues uh, according to multiplicities. We do not know a priori at which position in this sequence we find Dirichlet and at which position we find Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues. But if I just join them into a sequence, then I exactly get the spectrum of this new operator corresponding to this by our quadratic form. And of course, since this is a self adjoint operator, it gives me immediately a min max characterization of this sequence of eigenvalues. And it's, of course, simply the, the quadratic form divided by the norm of u squared, uh, and then the usual thing, taking the minimum of all k-dimensional subspaces of the form domain, and within each of these spaces, uh, the maximum. And this is somehow what we are going to, to use in order to uh, show some 
some new inequalities between Norman and Dirichlet Laplacian eigenvalues, and somehow get away from this convexity assumption. Uh, so let us see what we get here. The theorem that I want to try to convince you that it is true is the following. Uh, if I take omega bounded simply connected Lipschitz domain, so it's no longer convex, it's only simply connected. So that is a considerably, I would say, considerably larger class of domains. Uh, then I can always show the, the non-strict inequality. So we are in space dimension two. So the shift that we are expecting here is at the optimal sh shift that one can reach at most in general, as we have seen in the, the example of the disk, is a two here. And indeed, I claim that mu k plus two is less or equal lambda k for all k. Um, Currently, I'm not always able to show a strict inequality here. I can give you some cases in which the inequality is strict. Uh, I don't think that these conditions are optimal. I would rather expect that the inequality is always strict. The conditions are, however, like this. So if lambda k is a simple eigenvalue, I can show that this is strict. And I will show you, try to convince you of the proof of that in a moment. Or if the boundary, and this is somehow kind of an odd condition, if the boundary contains a straight line segment somewhere, so some, say, set of positive measure on which it is part of a plane, then the inequality is also strict. As I said, I, I'm expecting that the inequality should always be strict, and that one should also be able to prove that. Um, but here there's some technicality that I cannot resolve currently. However, I want to show you the proof of a simple situation. If, yeah, namely, um, what do I want to show you? It's not, not such a simple situation, but I want basically to prove this inequality in the case that lambda k is a simple eigenvalue. Um, what do we do? The whole idea is, I do have this operator that unites the Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues. And I would like to compare this operator acting on two component vector fields with the operator that is just two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian. That is some of the basic idea. In order to do that, I look at the quadratic form that belongs to two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian. This quadratic form looks like this. That is very simple. I just have the, the integral of gradient of the first component u1 squared plus gradient of the second component u2 squared um, on the form domain consisting of all vector fields whose components belong to h10. So this is completely decoupled. This is just two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian. And I want to compare this to the quadratic form that we have seen before. So first of all, the domain of this one, so h10 in both components, is contained in the domain of A, simply because well, whatever boundary condition we had here is certainly satisfied if the vector fields are zero on the whole boundary. And now we take some u in the domain of B, so some u that is h10 in both components, and we compute the new quadratic form on this vector field u. Uh, and what we get is, well, the new quadratic form was the divergence of u squared plus the vorticity of u squared. The divergence of u squared is simply this. The vorticity of u squared is simply this. Now, if I compute this, then I get the gradient of u1 squared plus the gradient of u2 squared plus some mixed terms. So the mixed terms are d1u1, d2u2 minus d1u2, d2u1. And this one appears uh, twice. So from the first product, of course, I get the first one. And from the other one, I get the other one. Um, but of course, if I integrate this one by parts, 
well, I can put this partial derivative onto U1 without getting any boundary terms because U2 is vanishes on the boundary and then I could put the D1 to the other side without getting any boundary terms still because U2 is zero on the boundary. So by the boundary condition, actually, this whole term just vanishes. And what I actually get is exactly the quadratic form of two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian. So what we've shown is actually that the form A is in the form sense less or equal to the form B. This would already imply that the, for instance, the eigenvalue of index 2K of two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian is larger or equal the eigenvalue of index 2k of the operator a. That is, that the eigenvalue of index 2k of the operator a is was de denoted by eta 2k earlier. And the eigenvalue of index 2k of two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian is lambda k. This is not yet entirely sufficient in order to get the inequality that we want. But out of abstract principles comparing quadratic forms, it is clear that if we can show that, so we have basically shown that the operator A and the operator B, so A is less or equal B in the form sense or in the sense of resolvance or in whatever sense you like. Um, in particular, the spectra are bounded by each other. But if we can even show that the two operators, so A is our new operator and B is two copies of the Dirichlet class, and if we can show that these operators do not have any joint eigenfunction, then actually these eigenvalue inequalities must be strict, meaning in particular that eta 2k is less than lambda k. And now let us assume for a moment that we already knew that these two operators would not have any joint eigenfunction. So we had eta 2k is below lambda k. What does that mean? Eta 2k, so these eigenvalues eta 1, eta 2, and so on, these are, again, just the union of Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacian eigenvalues. So I have 2k eigenvalues of these strictly below lambda k. Among these 2k eigenvalues, at most k minus 1 belong to the Dirichlet Laplacian because we are strictly below lambda k. But if at most k minus 1 are Dirichlet, then at least k plus 1 must be Neumann. And these are only the positive eigenvalue. Then we have to add the zero eigenvalue. So we have k plus 2 Neumann eigenvalues strictly below lambda k. So minus Laplacian has a, a Neumann Laplacian has at least k plus one eigenvalues in zero lambda k without zero, and then we add the zero eigenvalue and we get k plus two. So in that, assuming that we have shown that a and b do not have any joint eigenfunctions, we have arrived at this inequality. Now, um, let us show in the situation that lambda k is simple, that this actually is the case. So assume they have a joint eigenfunction. That is, u is, on the one hand, an eigenfunction of the of two copies of the Dirichlet Laplacian. And that would mean its components are Dirichlet Laplacian eigenfunctions corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda k. Now, if the eigenvalue is simple, um, there is only one up to multiples, only one eigenfunction. So then in that case, it is just a constant vector times phi. On the other hand, uh, if u at the same time is an eigen an eigenfield of our new operator A, then it decomposes into potentially one part that is the gradient of a Neumann Laplacian eigenfunction and one part that is a perpendicular gradient of a Dirichlet Laplacian eigenfunction, because that is exactly um, what we have seen, what the structure of the eigenspaces 
of this new operator looks like. But in that case, um, in that case, the vorticity of u is actually zero because the vorticity of u is vorticity of gradient psi, which is constantly zero, plus the vorticity of gradient perp phi, which is Laplacian phi, which is minus lambda phi, and phi vanishes on the boundary. But if I compute the vorticity of u on this side of the equation, I get um, the vector minus beta alpha times the gradient of phi. So I get the derivative of phi in the direction of minus beta alpha. And just to make sure, am I still, do you still hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. I was just a bit unsure. Thanks. Um, so what we have seen here is that the derivative of phi in a certain direction is zero on the whole boundary. But that basically says there must be some part of the boundary on which the gradient of phi is equal to zero, because the tangen tangential derivative of phi is always zero, and there must be some uh, considerable portion of the boundary on which this vector is not the tangential direction. So I get the function is zero on the boundary and on some part of positive measure, say also the gradient is zero, and that contradicts unique continuation. So in this situation, for instance, we can show that there cannot exist any joint eigenfunction of the two operators. And then we are exactly in this case and we get the strict inequality. And there's kind of similar arguments to be done to show that in any case, there is at least a less or equal sign here. And somehow the whole thing relies basically on the Helmholtz decomposition and its simple form when omega is simply connected. No curvature of the boundary enters here. So no convexity, naturally no convexity is, is needed. I want to almost come to an end. I want to show you just a simple corollary. I think basically all of you would immediately know how to prove it. Um, so if omega in R2 is a bounded simply connected Lipschitz domain, then, okay, mu3 is less than lambda1. That is, follows just from the fact that lambda1 always is a simple eigenvalue. But that implies in particular that no eigenfunction of the Neumann Laplacian on a simply connected planar domain corresponding to mu3 may have a closed nodal line. Because if it had a closed nodal line, we would have a directly, mu3 would be the directly Laplacian eigen a directly Laplacian eigenvalue of an even smaller domain, contradicting domain monotonicity of directly Laplacian eigenvalues. So this is, this is something that you have automatically as soon as you know that you are below the first directly Laplacian eigenvalue. Um, and this is a well-known argument for, for mu2. And of course, we, we had it before from u3 in the case that omega is convex, but here now we get it also somehow for free in the case that omega is uh, just simply connected. And to come to an end, I would just like to comment on some potential future things to be done. Uh, the obvious question is what happens to non-simply connected domains? And somehow what I can tell you is um, well, what happens? The Helmholtz decomposition looks a bit different in the sense that there is a third part, basically consisting of harmonic vector fields, meaning that the operator, the auxiliary operator A I was talking about has an additional kernel, um, and you have to deal with this additional kernel. And on the other hand, as I said, somehow numerics indicates that the inequalities get even somehow better or stronger, the more I'm away from convex or even simply connected domains in some sense. Um, what happens in higher dimensions? In higher dimensions, actually, it turns out that the situation is slightly different because this technique of constructing an operator that has 
exactly the Neumann and Dirichlet are passed in eigenvalues as a spectrum, uh, still works on the Neumann part, but it does not really work on the Dirichlet part in the sense that you can do an analogous construction in the more or less obvious way, but the operator that does another, the second part of the operator um, has a spectrum that no longer has to be the same as for the Dirichlet Laplacian. So then the connection by taking these perpendicular gradients of Dirichlet Laplacian eigenvalues is something that you apparently lose in higher dimensions. And then uh, finally, I would like to point out that I'm pretty much interested in what else can one do with this kind of non-standard variational principle? So originally I constructed something at least similar in order to get some, some insight in the hotspots conjecture. Uh, and I did not really think of eigenvalue inequalities of this type. And only later I discovered that if one formulates these principles slightly differently, then you can use them in the way you have seen today in order to prove eigenvalue inequalities. And I would not be surprised if there were more things to, to, to achieve or achievable by using these principles that have not somehow been exploited so much so far. So that I think is an interesting thing to, to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, please just uh, ask it by unmuting yourself or perhaps ask it in the chat and we can relay it. Can you write down <coughs> Formula for this operator A? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, the operator A actually is, is a Laplacian. So it acts as the Laplacian on two component vector fields. And you can also somehow compute the boundary conditions. So one of them is, of course, the one from the quadratic form, the vector fields being tangential on the boundary. And the other one is basically, in a weak sense, that the vorticity vanishes on the boundary. Okay, thank you. For your talk, so uh, may I ask to what, ex you know, what extent this kind of uh, non-standard variational principle can, can be extended to the case of surfaces? Can you leave the Euclidean setting and... Um, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on these kind of things, but somehow the the thing that you do here, like taking gradients of um, of eigenfunctions to to get some functions that still satisfy the eigenvalue equation, uh, that is something that at least to me feels a bit like restricted to somehow to straight coordinates. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay, yeah. Uh, can I ask? Um, so, have you, does this proof have anything related to the proof you showed us with the, the original proof for convex things? Because it seems similar, because here you're using derivatives of eigenfunctions and they're using derivatives of eigenfunctions. Is there yeah. any way, in, is that proof just sort of rewriting this proof or are they genuinely different? I mean, that is a very good question. I'm not entirely sure, actually. I mean, somehow the thing with the the old proof is that you see the curvature and you don't have any, or you don't know any other possibility to estimate this curvature integral than by just saying, okay, we take the curvature on a negative, which somehow does not appear here. This is why we can go to simply connected domains here. Um, on the other hand, um, when I was preparing this, this talk, I actually thought about it once more and somehow I thought the property, or let me put it this way, this, uh, the quadratic form I'm considering here can also be expressed differently in terms of something that involves the curvature. And then it is no longer obvious that the quadratic form is non-negative, except by going back to this formulation of the quadratic form where you see it. And this connection between a curvature term where you don't see it 
that it's not negative or this variant where you see it that might be something that is that the two approaches have in common so maybe um by exploiting some, somehow the 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 Helmholtz decomposition and these things uh, in order to understand the whole expression you have here better and to see that it's still maybe has the right or the, the whole thing has the right sign if only the domain is simply connected that is maybe something that is that might be not impossible but i don't know how for the moment and and this proof for high dimension you just put the uh... Uh, like more more joyous and it works the same way maybe so with the, more no the, not this one the, this, the, the one this one yeah, yeah. The, the old exactly the old one works basically the same way for higher dimensions you just take all the partial derivatives and do the same kind of computations you get some you know some some higher dimensional curvature terms of course but everything basically is works exactly according to this idea yeah, interesting maybe that's somehow hence on how to do yours yeah, yeah it's it's a good question indeed yeah thank you anyone else wants to uh comment or ask a question to jonathan if not thank you again jonathan it was a great talk and very interesting topic um, thank you very much and we'll meet again next week for a talk by antoine metra who will speak about the right value optimization thank you everyone uh, have a great week be safe and once more, sorry for the interruption. <laughs>